Hi, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for what I hope will be an informative, helpful, engaging conversations. Um, you are joining the webinar, Defining the New Normal, Post-Coronavirus Events and Conferences. I know this is weighing heavily on everyone's mind. This is honestly one of the highest uh, attended webinars we've ever produced. And I know it's because there are just copious amounts of questions as to what is the world gonna look like? What do we need to be considering? Um, you know, our industry is literally being turned upside down. So uh, I'm really hoping that we can provide you all with some some relevant and helpful content. We've gathered a great group of presenters today. Um, you are in the right place. Um, so I am Tara and uh, I work for Pathable. I am our VP of Marketing and Operations. Um, I will go through an introduction of all of our phenomenal panelists in just a moment. This webinar is being recorded, so it will be made available to all of you, um, whether you've been able to join us here in person or not um, after the fact. Um, we always like to make these available on an ongoing basis. Um, so obviously we've kicked things off. I'm gonna do some uh, introductions for all of our phenomenal panelists. Um, and then we'll give each presenter about 10 minutes to share their, their, um, their thoughts, their ideas. Uh, and we'll also give them 10 minutes of dedicated question and answer time for their specific section, leaving time at the end for a more broad uh, Q&A conversation. So as questions come up for you, please go ahead and type them into your questions box. I am our moderator, so I will be keeping an eye on all of the questions as they come in. So I will field those to our uh, panelists as appropriate. Um, so hello, this is me. I am Tara Barnes, like I said, our uh, uh, VP of Marketing and Operations here at Pathable. So I have six years of experience in the um, event space. And so having these long lasting relationships with planners, suppliers, vendors, um, I just truly uh, understand all of what's happening right now and, and feel appreciative that we're able to sit with you today and give you this resource. So um, I'd love to introduce you to our panel of experts. Joining us today is Corbin Ball, um, CSP, CMP, DES. He is an international speaker, consultant, and writer helping clients worldwide use technology to save time and improve productivity. After 18 years of running international citywide technology meetings, Corbin transitioned in 1997 to become a highly acclaimed speaker with the ability to make complex subjects understandable and fun. Corbin is a 2018 inductee into the Event Industry Council's Hall of Leaders, the most prestigious honor in the meetings, conventions, exhibition, and events industry. Additionally, Corbin has been named one of the top, uh, excuse me, the, the 25 most influential people in the meetings industry five times by successful meetings news magazines. Um, we also have joining us uh, Jennifer Loftus, MBA, SPHR. There's a lot of wonderful <laughs> acronyms she has after her name. PHRCA, GPHR, SHRM-SCP, CCP, CBP, GRP. If anyone knows what all of those are, hats off to you. Um, is a founding partner uh, of and national director at Astron Solutions, a human resource consulting firm headquartered in New York City. With 24 years of experience, Jennifer's expertise lies in total rewards, customized market surveys, employee surveys, and technology-based HR solutions. Jennifer is a sought-after speaker on local and national television, radio, and conferences. She's been published in local and national periodicals. She is an active HR association volunteer leader, instructor, and subject matter expert. Jennifer holds adjunct professor roles at Pace University and LIM College. Jennifer has an MBA in uh, Human Resource Management, highest honors from Pace University, and has a BS in Accounting, summa cum laude, from Rutgers University. She received the 2014 Gotham Comedy Foundation's Lifetime Ambassador of Laughter Award. So great to have you with us, Jennifer. Um, we also have joining us Lance A. Simons, uh, CVEP, uh, Senior Director of Business Development at Blue Sky eLearn. Lance has 17 years of experience selling, implementing, and using e-learning platforms. He has spent his entire career working with technology, beginning in 1982 as a PC computer salesperson. Lance has focused on serving association and nonprofit solutions since 2001. 
In 2008, Lance created the Certified Virtual Events Producer CVEP Certificate, a six-week training program with over 400 graduates to date. And last but certainly not least, we have James Ellsmore. James is the Director of Island Innovation, a communications and consulting agency focused on solutions for sustainable development in remote and rural locations. Last year, Island Innovation hosted an ino the inaugural Virtual Island Summit, which brought together 4,000 participants from uh, St. Lucia to Scotland to Samoa to share stories about their islands. James has always used technology to advance his mission, allowing him to live and work anywhere as a digital nomad and manage a team of uh, spread over four continents. He was awarded Forbes Magazine's 30 Under 30 Award for Young Entrepreneurs. So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy lives to join us today. Greatly appreciate having you here. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand over the presentation uh, to Corbin, who will talk us through his thoughts on um, events beyond 2020. So bear with me one moment and I will kick it over to Corbin. Okay, well, thank you, Tara, and it's a pleasure. Good morning, afternoon, or evening to uh, all of you that are attending. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'll be speaking about what's going to be happening with uh, events and exhibitions in, the, uh, in these next few years. And um, I, I would like to, there's a, a the Chinese word for uh, crisis is actually two characters, and it's a, one of those characters means a time of danger, and the other is a time of opportunity. And I think during this pandemic, we are having uh, a very significant amount of uh, opportunities that are happening at a time of very significant innovation. And, uh, and that's what I'll be speaking about part of this as we go through what the changes are and where it is. But uh, before I do that, I have two uh, uh, demographic questions I'd la like to ask. And, and the first one is, um, and uh, Tara, if you go ahead and put that up, if you are you an event planner? or an event supplier or other. Okay, we've got the polls rolling in. Thank you all. So Corbin, just let me know when you'd like me to close that poll. Okay, uh, yeah, I have, um, uh, go, go ahead and close that up and uh, let's, let's see the results on that. There you are. Um, you know, uh, Tara, I, I just realized I don't I don't see that polling. Got it. Understood. So issue. we have 83% uh, of our audience is identifying as, a, as an event planner. 9% is identifying as a, an event industry supplier and 8% are identifying as other. OK, so we have lots of planners here. Great. Welcome to all of you with that. Uh, the, the second question is, what is your current employment uh, status? And if you uh, I'll read it through as we go through as so if you pull it poll. Well, Paul is, uh, are you working full-time at a business location? Are you working full-time remotely? Are, are you remain re employed but are working part-time? I remain employed but I'm not working in a, uh, for a defined period or unemployed? So the results are still rolling in. Okay. We've got 63% have shared their feedback. So this is an engaged audience, that's wonderful. <laughs> I'm just watching the, the percentage tick up. So now we were at 72%, just let me know when you'd like to close. But okay, we still yeah, I'll let you, as I can't see the polling on this end, uh, if you sure. do, just go ahead and- We'll go ahead and close me. the poll. Thank you all for sharing. And so the results are 4% um, are working full-time at a business location. 84% are working full-time remotely. 7% remain employed but are working part-time, 2% remain employed but are currently not working um, for a defined period of time, and 3% are unemployed. Okay, well, I wish you all the best, especially for you not working or unemployed right now. I would certainly wish you the best with this and uh, as we go through, but it's really interesting that uh, there's such a large um, percentage of working full-time uh, but working remotely. I think that that leads right into what I'll be sp speaking about as well. Uh, this is a time of very significant innovation. And it um, is, you know, are you, uh, 
And um, it, this has been happening in many ways. And for example, the um, Hilton, the hotels have kind of seen a lot of innovation with that. They've opened up, uh, Hilton hotels open up a million uh, rooms for frontline medical workers. The Four Seasons New York City has opened up for healthcare workers. And uh, you're starting to see uh, things are working out, well, how they are going to change and what it's going to look like when we get through with this. Uh, Marriott just rolled out a new level of cleanliness standards with uh, electrostatic sprayers and disinfectant wipes in each room and distancing protocol signage, removing and rearranging uh, furniture in the lobby areas for more distancing, installing, installing sand, hand sanitizing stations throughout, uh, giving employees gloves and masks. And, uh, there's a whole range of things, and uh, but we're going to see hotels change really significantly. I think with that, with uh, you know eliminating buffets and temperature checks and all those things, we've seen uh, people come in. Uh, caterers are uh, in some cases becoming food delivery agents with that. We've had uh, the electro, uh, the decorating firms help set up uh, the hospitals and the convention centers with that, and the convention centers have really stepped into that. Uh, uh, lighting and electrical uh, workers with, uh, within the industry have been working to set up uh, different uh, 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 stations for the emergency, but for emergencies. But the area that I think that it's, I find that we are seeing in terms of directly in terms of meetings, the digital meeting innovation is a, is a very significant component of that. And so we are seeing everybody's are doing Zoom, um, an explosion of Zoom. We've seen Facebook Messenger has just announced their Zoom uh, rival for Facebook Messenger rooms. Uh, major registration companies uh, such as Cvent uh, have integrated in with the uh, digital uh, formats such as On24, uh, on Zoom, WebEx, Adobe Eventry. Um, Pathable, uh, the sponsors of this one, have, has a whole virtual meeting uh, format. Uh, companies such as Hello Endless, who uh, specialize in running digital meetings, they're hiring. They're, uh, it's, it's exploding in their areas. And I think you're, what's happening, you're seeing a big jump in um, brand new uh, type of uh, products out there, digital uh, event products out there. Hopin.to, pandomeetings.com, Explo platform are ones that are really reinventing how do you make a, a virtual or digital meeting uh, more like a face-to-face -face meeting with that. Um, and I think that uh, uh, digital meetings will retain a significantly larger market share at the end when this whole crisis, this pandemic passes, we people have gotten used to it. People are learning with it. They're figuring out new ways. And, uh, uh, school children and grandparents are learning how to use Zoom, and we. But it's working in and incorporating into a major, uh, a major way into the digital workspace, into the regular workspace, and uh, it has been an accelerator uh, for this adoption of this technology that's already coming, and we're going to be seeing that substantially grow. Uh, I think the face-to-face -face meetings will have a slow recovery uh, for two reasons: uh, fear of contagion is one and it's it's not going to really come back to normal until we get a, a full-time um, you know a, either vaccine or a, a cure that will uh, uh, fix the uh, uh, will take care of the standards with that uh, with that it's going to be it won't be a v-shape i think it's going to be a u-shape recovery even when the a lockdown in it's not going to be like just turning on the lights and so i think it's going to be a, a slow time also um there is a uh, the slow economic recovery as well uh, with that. It's a, you know, half the, the uh, IATA, International Air Transport Association, uh, thinks that half the world's airlines could vanish in the thin air. Uh, Delta president uh, says that uh, their business is off by 95% and it doesn't see, it's gonna be three years before uh, they get back to normal. They, um, the U.S. Travel Association said the impact will be nine times greater than 9/11, and so um, there are some uh, there are some challenges that we will have with that. But I think that meetings will come back. First of all, I'm a huge believer in face-to-face -face meetings. They 
um, can do things in a more effective way uh, in some ways than we have been able to do in the past. We're brainstorming, for networking, for relationship building, for uh, there are benefits. But I think that we're going to have this going to be changed. Uh, starting with the, the small and local meetings will be the first to recover. And but you're going to have to figure out, you know, how are you going to do insurance to force me or and, and how do you tend if attendees or your staff uh, get sick with this, the insurance coverage for that. Uh, need to work out social distancing and sanitation and disinfectants. Uh, handling how you would handle the people that show symptoms and, the, and perhaps for a while that the vulnerable population until we get a vaccine uh, should be discouraged from uh, uh, coming to it. I think that uh, um, there with the hybrid meetings uh, and as they do recover, I think that hybrid meetings will be required for many events. And so as we work into this, as people have gotten used to the digital meetings component of it, as you raise your way in, some people that have had the um, COVID can come back uh, with that, this, this, with the distancing standards, but there are many people that still will not feel comfortable. I think that's where we're gonna see a big explosion in hybrid meetings as a way to ease people back into it. I think the large international meetings will be the last to recover from this. And this is a picture of last year's IMAX America. And it's a, um, you know, crowds like that are not gonna be able to happen for a while. Uh, and it's, you see that with the major corporations. Uh, uh, the LA mayor confirmed that they will not authorize any large events or concerts until 2021. Microsoft is converting all their meetings this year into digital only. Uh, Facebook has announced that they, they canceled all their large meetings and through June uh, 2021. And really for things that fully take, uh, get back to normal, again, it's gonna be the virus and the, uh, or a, a cure or a way of treatment to, that will keep people from uh, experiencing the negative, uh, very negative effects of, of COVID with that. So we are adjusting to the new normal with that. And it's, uh, and I think that we will, uh, as I say, I think face-to-face -face meetings, we are uh, gregarious animals. Um, we like to meet, we have a, uh, we will have a need. There's gonna be a pent up demand after being shut in for some time, but it's gonna be a relatively slow recovery as we go into it. And with that, I will turn it uh, back over to Tara and uh, we can uh, uh, to field any questions as they come through. Yeah, there there have been some good questions, Corbin, one of which is, do you have any information on what constitutes the a, a large international meeting? So is that over 500, over 1,000? We're getting questions around, like, what exactly does that look like? Well, I think, well, you start looking at the state guidelines and they, uh, some of them, you know, when they talk, but when the uh, lockdown is finished, you know, it's a group, small groups, and they'll say either 10 or they'll say 50 people. I think that's where you're gonna start those re relatively small groups. I think, you know, groups of 100 or 200 or more, it's gonna be a depend on how you can manage the social distancing with that, because that's gonna be, a required component, I think, with this is going to be a little bit different world out there. And so, the large international meetings of a thousand or more, um, that's going to be uh, uh, that's going to take the slowest uh, time to recover because uh, the of the difficulties of uh, of doing the uh, of taking care of those social distancing issues. Yes, and one of our other questions was about more mid-sized, eighty to two hundred. Um, programs happening in in 2020 anywhere in the world and it sounds like you're suggesting that it's really going to depend on you know whatever whenever that moment in time is and where specifically it was intended to be happening and then what that planners um, intentionality and directives are around how people can attend physically and be able to maintain that social distancing protocol you know this this u-shaped recovery it's going to be it's going to take a while as people gradually uh, get used to it uh, as there becomes more people catch it if there's a high uh, herd immunity that can happen then uh, you know there may be ways of uh, having that validated so you could uh, go to these meetings with it so it, i just think it's going to be a while for things really to uh, fully come back to 
to normal with that. It's, uh, um, there, there are big insurance issues. There are big, uh, it just health issues with that. That it's a, uh, um, but I think you'll see that you'll start seeing this in 2021. Um, hopefully, we'll have start getting a handle on testing. We'll start getting a handle on, on uh, contact tracing, and hopefully that there's going to be some way of uh, for the people that really do get sick to um, be um, the those symptoms to be reduced in a way so that the people aren't afraid of dying by going out and uh, and being in public. Yeah, absolutely. And we have a, we have a couple more minutes, and we are still having questions come in. I'm just being mindful of our time. Um, yeah. Some um, someone had a question around what impact do you think all of this is going to have on the weddings and special events industry? If you have any thoughts on that, um, you know, special events has been. A, a, I think it's kind of the same thing. I and mean, people will be uh, uh, weddings are going to be. You know, it's going to be a matter of size and how you can socially distance and. Their, their family members and it's uh, I think that uh, everything is going to be a little uh, there's going to be a little challenge not just from the uh, the uh, physical uh, threat of the, of the contagion but also the economic threat as well it's just going to be people are are going to, it's going to be harder for uh, many people to uh, to take advantage of these and I think weddings, you know, it, it will be a way people know each other at least, and they can know, if, um, you know, their their closer communities. I think there will, there certainly will be weddings. I just don't expect that there are going to be the, uh, big, large gala events um, connected with it. Mm -hmm. And we have one more minute. Um, so some of these I'll I'll make sure that we save for the Q and A at the end because these are wonderful questions coming in. Um, a question that I think I'll bump down is, is about uh, sponsorships um, and going virtual because I think that we can talk about that in a broader context. Um, but really quickly, Corbin, could you define um, how you see hybrid events and conferences? What does that mean to you? Well, uh, it's going to be, you'll have face-to-face -face meetings, but there will be a component that people will be able to join digitally. And so that they'll be able to log in. Uh, the, it's, there's a lot of innovation that's happening in this in this space, and there will continue to be more. Uh, there are many things that you have to think about. It's not just putting a camera in the back of the room. It's really about how you engage uh, the uh, the remote attendees, how you plan content for them. Have you, do you have an MC to manage that? I think that's a good practice that uh, people will have. So there are a number of ways you can do that, but it's really the combining of a face-to-face -face meeting with a smaller attendance with this digital uh, uh, means of people being able to attend the meeting as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Thank you, Corbin, so much for all your thoughts. Um, this will not be the last you hear from Corbin. We'll, we'll have some time at the end for a broader discussion, but I do wanna make sure that we pass the baton to Jennifer so that she can continue on um, this fantastic conversation. So Jennifer, whenever you are ready. Excellent. Well, thank you, Tara, and hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here with you for a few moments this afternoon, this morning, depending on what time zone you are in. So building on what Corbin has already shared with us, now I'm going to take us on a journey looking at morale, particularly in this world where we're, we're feeling anxious and we're in this fight or flight mode. And how do we stay positive? Positive for ourselves, for our employees, for our attendees who would be coming to our events. And if I think back over the last, I don't have to think long, the last four months, what was I doing? The first part of 2020, I was working on several different presentations and I was planning to be in a, a small group setting like Corbin had just described for us and a couple of large group settings as well, talking about some trends in human resources, getting those slide decks ready, thinking about the activities, thinking and planning all of the travel arrangements that went on with that. And then COVID-19 happened. And seemingly overnight, everything was closed. Now what do we do? We socially distance, or I like to think of it as physical distancing, right? We still wanna keep that social connection just from further away. We spend a lot more time washing our hands, cleaning our surfaces, our 
disinfecting gel, our wipes, these have become our new best friends. We spend so much time with these. And how does that leave us feeling for a lot of us? We're feeling alone, scared, frightened, right? Now, you know, even as I look at Facebook, I'm starting to see posts of whose relatives have passed away, who's been sick. I'm hearing about this from clients, prospects, friends. It's getting very scary. And there are some days when probably you're, you're like the uh, person on this slide where you're like, what is the point? Why, why should I get out of bed? I know it is safe in here. But we have to always think about our connections. Granted, we're not close like that picture we saw from the large global conference, but connection is so important, whether it is physical or whether it is like we're doing here through technology. And so Tara, I have a poll that I'd like, uh, if you could please open this up for our attendees to hear. We wanna hear from them. And the question is, how connected with your workplace do you feel today? And there's a couple different ways that you could think about this. One would be if you, well, we're all employees, right? Except for the, the few, unfortunately, who are furloughed or laid off or, or perhaps retired, uh, with your coworkers, with your manager. If you have employees reporting to you, how connected do you feel with those direct reports? And also think about your constituents, right? The members of your association, or if you're an event planner, which many of you are, the people who'd be coming to your events that might be happening right now or next month or June. I know for us, this is a busy conference season. So in terms of your feelings, how connected do you feel with your workplace today? And I know these terms are a little subjective, but give, give it your best guess here. Uh, are you more connected, a little more connected, the same as before COVID-19, a little less connected or much less connected. And Tara, I'll be replying or relying on you. Yes, we have 60%, yeah, 60%. Um, so maybe give it another couple seconds and then we'll, I'll share with you what people have shared with us. Excellent, thank you, because I want to see 100% participation. Now's the time, <laughs> we want to hear your voice. So come on in, it just takes a second to, to vote on that poll. And remember, just, uh, I did have a question. So the polls are popping up through uh, the GoToWebinar software. So in your dashboard, you should see uh, this option for the poll. So um, if you haven't already found it, that's where they're located. And this is not your last chance. We'll have, Jennifer will have another poll. So Jennifer, we're at 70, so probably a good time to, I think to we'll, close yes. this one. Yeah. All right, okay. so in the interest of time, thank you, Tara. We'll close the poll. And let's see how connected do we feel and sharing the results. Okay, so it looks like the majority, now I have a very tiny version of this, but it looks like the majority are a little less connected. Let me see Correct, if I can make yeah. this bigger mm -hmm. or not. Uh, Probably not so much. All right, 36% a little less connected. Another, I think, 18% much less connected. All right, so that's going to be over half, half of our uh, participants mm -hmm. today, and then another 20% the same. All right, so that's good. 16% uh, it looks like a little more connected. Excellent. That's a pleasant surprise, and even more pleasantly surprising, those 9% who say they are much more connected than they were before COVID-19. So interesting, we've got, a, we've got a range of responses here. So that's very helpful. Thank you for making your voice heard. Okay. So speaking of, of being connected, I, I know in the introductions, Tara mentioned that I'm in New York City and for the last uh, couple of months, this has been the view from my home office. New York is not always as glamorous as it might seem. My apartment is relatively small. It is narrow, but it is tall. I have two floors, so if I want to change things up a little bit, I go upstairs and I look at a different part of the brick wall. Talk about reaching out and looking for connection in an environment like this. And for those of you who have yards, I am extremely jealous of, of that. But we, we need it. We crave it. And yet, if we listen to the news every day, it probably feels like that, that finish line that we're looking for. And we know this is a long-term event that we're dealing with, but that finish line that we're looking for keeps getting pushed out. So here in New York, we were thinking about restarting 
April 15th, no. April 29th, no. May 15th, no. New Jersey closed indefinitely. So it's like, are we ever actually going to get there? So we know we're in this for the long haul. So how do we make it through this ultra marathon now? Yeah, so if our marathon is 26.2 miles, the ultra marathon is, I, I think it's something like 50 or, or so miles. How do we get through that? But recognizing that there are small sprints along the way and we can engage our constituents, our employees, our coworkers. We can maintain our morale if we think about it as small sprints that we're going through every day. It, breaks it down, puts it into small chunks, makes it much more manageable, much less upsetting, right? Because if I think now, wow, this conference has been canceled. This one's been canceled. I've been looking forward to this one. Uh, I had one, I was going to go to Hawaii for a conference that got canceled. Yeah. So you can feel the frustration, you know, building up in there. So what do we do? Number one, acknowledge the emotions, right? Ask yourself, how am I feeling? Why am I feeling this way? Talk with your employees. Not, I'm not suggesting that we become psychologists or psychotherapists or anything like that, but just ask, how are you doing today? How are you feeling? What's your stress level today on a scale of one to 10 or possibly even off the chart and why? Let's talk about that. There's probably a lot we can't control for, but there are some things that undoubtedly we can tackle. And when we achieve those items, we feel good, our morale boosts. So that's step one talk with other people, video chat, so important. I'll talk about that in a couple more moments as well, but talk about the, the reality, the, the rawness that we may be feeling. And also thinking about feelings. I know a lot of the emails that I have received of late from, from clients, some of them have been edgy, right? And if I responded right away, that probably wouldn't end up being a good situation. So we have to think about how I respond to an email a phone call, a text message, whatever that might be, versus how I react. All right, so take that moment, breathe deep, maybe it's 10 minutes of deep breathing, depending on what's coming through in that email, and think about, all right, I could react this way, but what are those long-term consequences? How do I respond? How do I not feel frustrated? Maybe I can find out what's triggering those emotions in the other person, so that way, you know, I have greater understanding and we can work together and move forward accordingly. All right, so some other ideas that I have here for you for these small sprints, you can use these again with your employees, your coworkers, with your constituents, your attendees, your members as well. Communication is so important. Keep telling stories. Tell stories of resilience. Tell a gratitude story. Tell a funny story. Oh my gosh, I, I always love to share that when I have a daily, daily video chat with my team members. What's funny? What's new? What's happening? What was something good that happened that I didn't quite expect? And it's so important to keep those visual connections like we are doing here, whether you're using Zoom or Teams or GoToWebinar or any other platform, get those web cameras on hold those daily team meetings, have those virtual hangouts, and through everything you're doing, over communicate. It is better to share too much, for people to hear too much from you than too little. That reinforced communication keeps morale up, keeps spirits up, keeps us moving forward to the time when we're on the upward side of that U-shaped recovery that Corbin shared with us. And use this time to your advantage. Instead of saying, oh, I'm looking at the brick wall and I never leave my apartment or my home, think about, all right, what were we doing with our meetings in the workplace that we don't need to do anymore, that we've now discovered? And how can we use this time to explore new ideas and to innovate? The excitement, the energy that can come with that is essential for getting through this ultra marathon. And the last thing before I turn back over to Tara is it's so important to take care of yourself. If you are not feeling good, that's gonna come through in all of your communications and morale is going to either be successful or, or increase because of that or 
suffer because of that. So emphasize well-being, your own well-being, that of your employees, your coworkers, and your constituents. Your organization needs you right now. We need you to be successful, to think about what's next and how do we position ourselves for success. You can't do that if you're not feeling well. So emphasize that well-being. How do we do that? It's hard, especially if you are in a small space, a couple hundred square feet, maybe your home. So what do we do? Maybe it's a step tracker challenge so we can keep the energy moving. Maybe it's working fitness into your day, right? Instead of sitting for everything, walk around, do some lunges, some squats. We've all got a lot of canned goods in our pantry. Use that for your bicep curls, right? You, you've got the food and you've got exercise at the same time. Last two items, it is so critical to keep to regular office hours. And I use that with air quotes because what is regular? But there's that temptation when we are home and the computer is right there that, oh, let me take care of a couple more emails. Oh, let me just look up this one more thing. And then you've been working from six in the morning until nine o'clock at night. Keep as best you can to a nine to five, eight to four, seven to four schedule, something like that. And make sure you've got time to do other things. You know, no matter how seemingly insignificant they may be, they're going to make a difference for your own physical health, your well-being, and that's going to come through in your communications with everyone. And last but not least, if you're feeling exhausted, some days are more exhausting than others. Absolutely. Depending on what you're messaging and what you're communicating out, take that power nap. If your manager has any trouble with that, send them to me. I will be happy to vouch for you. But take a few minutes. We all in HR, we recognize that people are not going to be working nine to five, a hundred percent productivity like we were when we were in the office. There are distractions with pets and children and laundry and everything else going on. So if you're feeling tired, overwhelmed, or not sure what to do about a situation, take a break, take a power nap, watch TV for five minutes, whatever that might be. So you come back charged up, ready to get through that sprint that's going to lead us on this ultra marathon journey so that we will be successful. We'll reach that finish line. Last thought in closing here. So here in, in New York, and I know we've got attendees from all over the globe and each of us could add in our own photos to this slide. In New York, we've been through a lot. 9-11, Superstorm Sandy, the recession, you name it. We always come through. And I know everyone in America always comes through, indeed the world, we always come through and we will get through this. And it's so important to keep remembering that because it gets hard when you're in the day to day, but also in your communications. Let people know, don't panic, don't be nervous. We will come back, we will be back together for those events and the happy hours and all of those things in due time, we'll get there. So let's enjoy this moment that we have now, contrary though that might sound, enjoy it now, use it for the best because when we get back out there, we're gonna be going full steam ahead. All right, so Tara, I'm wondering if there are any questions that may have come in over the there last few are. minutes. Yes, yeah, and I just wanted to call out, I really appreciated the slide around self-care. Uh, event planners, um, based on research that have been done, have one of the most stressful jobs in the yeah, world. Um, absolutely. I, I came from uh, a third-party agency managing a team of planners, and so I just think it's a really great reminder right now to find that time for self-care amid all this stress. Cause I, I, I know for myself, I planned a program myself. I was, you know, managing a team that did it, it in a client facing situation. It can be super challenging to, to step away. You feel like you're always on. So yeah. right now, even more than ever, that critical uh, importance of mm -hmm. finding time for something that brings you joy. So I just really yes. appreciated that um, perspective. Okay. Um, so we had a couple of questions come in and I want to encourage people, if you do have them to plug them in, I am keeping an eye on questions. Um, someone shared that they unfortunately have a team that is furloughed. Um, okay. So they've asked what are tools to get through this time? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. And I, I'm sure there are a number of people out there who have teams that have been furloughed or that may be coming before we know it. And that is one of the hardest things to do as a manager, as a business owner. So it's important that the people who are on furlough not feel forgotten. Granted, 
there, there's no work at this moment, but keep in communication with them. Let them know what's happening at the organization, how you're thinking about them. If there are plans in terms of reopening the business, now, of course, that's going to be subject to what happens, but keep them apprised. Don't make promises, right? We don't want to get into any uh, legal situations. I would defer to a, an HR legal counsel on that, but certainly keep communicating with them, whether it's an email, maybe it's just a happy hour, virtual happy hour. Hey, let's all get together. Let's hear what have you been doing? What's new? What's happening? What good things may have happened? Yeah, life is still happening. Babies are still being born. Yeah, weddings, although in a different format, they're still happening too. So let's let's get together and share that good news. But certainly don't let people feel forgotten. And particularly if you have employees who are in different countries, it's even more important to make sure you keep that, keep that glue together. Great, thank you. Um, this is a good segue into the next question, actually. Um, what are some other ideas for well-being virtual events that we can bring to an audience? And before you answer, Jennifer, someone else shared something that their, their organization did. Our community did a mile-a-thon and have already surpassed the thousand miles in quarantine so far. So thank you for sharing that. No. Uh, but, uh, would, yeah, would I love any thoughts you have. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So there's a few different things. One, the, uh, like the the mileathon, the fitness tracker. I know when we were meeting in person at some of our events, they would have those anyway. So that's an easy way to people are probably familiar with that to segue into the virtual world. Let's report in. Let's see what we're doing. Uh, let, let's keep active. So that could be one way. Uh, another could be if you've got the technology and the platform for this would be to host some kind of mindfulness minute, although it, it would need to be longer than that. Maybe it's a mindfulness 10 minutes at the start of a day or the end of the day. So again, people can get a little bit of peace of mind and you'll know yeah, what's that right timing for that. So that could be another idea. I've also seen some organizations who are holding virtual yoga classes, fitness classes, you know, streaming. So that could be another idea as well. Of course, I would suggest talk with your legal counsel just in case you don't want someone getting hurt by accident. Uh, but certainly that could be another option as well. Uh, a fourth one, and then I'll turn back over to you, Tara, it could be for uh, doing things with social media and hashtags and show us your yeah, insert the blank here, uh, new quarantine skill that you've learned or artwork you've created or something like that could, that could bring some, some joy, some fun, a little competitive spirit as well, and build connections so people know that they are not alone, even though they may be alone in their home or their apartment. Right. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Someone else had shared another uh, nice thought, which is the importance of sharing team stress relief something yes. to connect, recipe swapping, sharing photos yes. with the family. You talked about how we're all kind of, you know, now inundated with people's pets, but it is a way to create this <laughs> maybe intimacy and connection that hadn't existed before. It's a very weird silver lining of such a, a unique time we find ourselves in. So um, that's all the, the, the I see question wise. Again, we'll have time at the end for more questions. So please don't feel like you can't um, jump in after the fact. Mm -hmm. And so with that, I will um, turn things over to Lance, who will continue the conversation. So um, go ahead, Lance. We look forward to what you have to share. Thank you, Tara. I am, um, I, I, I am talking with uh, meeting planners. Uh, so much. Uh, some days it's literally back to back. And in, in, in a nutshell, what I'm being asked is uh, when it comes to this whole idea of virtual meetings and especially larger scale virtual meetings, uh, like where are we? Like it's almost like we're on a new planet together. And what, what, what are the the ter what's the terminology that we should be using? What are the different options that we have? And there's a lot of, let me just make sure I can forward. There's a lot of confusing and inconsistent jargon in this area that is probably being marketed to you all at the same time. 
you may be getting dozens of emails from vendors on the topic of virtual conferences, virtual meetings. Here's how to do it. It's really easy. So for all of us right now, it's a little bit like we're drinking from a fire hose like this young lady. And that's true for the vendors as well, by the way. Uh, it's just an amazing uh, time. So I'm going to focus on some terminology, sort of nuts and bolts, and try to give you in this uh, short amount of time a sense of how different technical components work together in order to deliver an all virtual conference experience. Now, as background, let me just mention that in 2008, there was a financial crisis in our nation and government, and conference travel was highly curtailed. And that impacted a whole wide range of conferences. And at that time, I decided to create a curriculum called the Certified Virtual Event Producer, or CVP, to teach, uh, at first it was government uh, professionals and then association professionals, how to produce an all virtual conference. Uh, it was a little bit ahead of its time, but it was on the screen here, I have basically the mind map of that course. It was a six week course. And the reason why I'm showing it to you is just so you maybe feel a little better about the breadth of the curriculum of the knowledge space of doing virtual events. Uh, the programs are not trivial. And especially if you want to produce them with excellence, it takes some time and it takes a, 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 a bringing together of tools and expertise. But there's a big advantage between the uh, difference between now and, and 2008, which is that the products and the services are so much more advanced, uh, so much more secure and so much more integrated together that we can pull off uh, much larger um, uh, events in an excellent manner. One unfortunate part of the current situation is that organizations, as you know, have lost significant amounts of money on conference locations and other arrangements that were already in place and where they can't get their money back. So I find myself talking with groups that basically need or want to use a mishmash of products that they already license in order to replace or extend a conference. And while that approach can be successful on a small scale, it's most often not the right approach, in my opinion, for larger scale events, especially in terms of creating a smooth and professionally supported user experience. So one question that I get is, what is the difference between a webinar and a virtual conference? So a virtual conference site or platform will have many of the same kinds of features as a physical conference has. There's going to be a facility for registration and payment processing. There's going to be a place where people can find the agenda. It might have mobile enablement as well as, well as normal laptop or computer uh, support. It might have sessions that are plenary sessions and then concurrent breakout sessions and rooms for those, spaces for those to occur. It might have an exhibit hall or a sponsor area and poster sessions and CE testing, all of these areas in a, um, in a consistent user interface in a way that can provide consistent reporting on the back end and really provide a nice space for people to operate in during the conference. So let's take a, a step back just to help us kind of get our sea legs as we move forward with this concept of virtual conferences. This is uh, a, a scenario that many of you will know where, where you want to broadcast from a physical conference. And on the left-hand side here, we see our plenary rooms and our breakout rooms. And if we want to broadcast all of this, then there'll be a mixer, a video mixer in each room. And that video mixer may just be taking the slides and audio, or maybe also taking some cameras, mixing together. Uh, it's a little hard to see, but in the bottom, we see a presenter and then some marketing and slides, and that format might change over time. And that's all being broadcasted up from each room 
to something called a content delivery network, a CDN. That's a term that you might hear as you talk with uh, vendors and solutions. And depending on the CDN service and the network load, the time delays of broadcasting that conference globally can be under 10 seconds. The CDN also handles the encoding of the video signal so that it can be delivered properly on different mobile and desktop devices. So your virtual conference attendees on the right-hand side are logging into this conference platform and they're being presented with an agenda each day and then they're going into each session where they see the view that is being brought to them from this content delivery network. Webinars can also easily be brought into this mix. And for example, you might have plenary sessions with multiple presenters, and that might be live at the beginning of each conference day. And then you might have breakout rooms and those can all be in webinars within a virtual conference. Advanced webinar systems, I'll just use Adobe Connect as an example, but there are uh, several others, are particularly useful where you want to have small groups or tables work on a specific topic and then report back out to the main group. Those can be implemented really nicely inside these more advanced webinar platforms. And I've facilitated many of these uh, breakouts, and it's a great way to get at what can be missing when we talk about virtual conferences, which is collaboration, relationship building, people getting together and talking in smaller units like we love to do when we're at a conference. So other formats of webcasting can be mixed in here, and you can you can you can have uh, um, environments and, and uh, virtual conferences where you have a mix of these webinars and webcasting like we were just seeing environments. Uh, just as an example, we just produced one of these uh, actually with Freeman. Freeman was doing the content delivery network and the uh, video mixing. And for this particular association, the pricing for their three day virtual conference was about $1,000 and they had 900 registrants. So uh, if we do the math on that, it's a fair amount of money uh, with no travel, no conference location costs. There's also another term that you may run into, which is called Mock Live, M-O-C-K, Mock Live. And with a Mock Live virtual conference, all the sessions, or at least most of them, are pre-recorded. And that takes a tremendous amount of the risk and production cost out of the process. The recordings can be done well ahead of time. They can be reviewed by the appropriate staff or committees. And then they're given to the virtual conference vendor, your partner, and they're played out to the audience at the specific times that you have on your agenda. And there can be many of these running concurrently. That is a really reliable and highly scalable and supportable way to implement and think about uh, possibilities for a virtual conference. And by the way, it doesn't mean that there's no uh, engagement. On the right-hand side of the screen, if you can see there, there's an engagement widget that even though this is a pre-recording, it allows people to be doing chat, building up word clouds, doing Q&A, uh, doing a, a more formal surveys and really interacting together. And even the presenters who originally presented the material can uh, be online for that. All right, in closing, I wanted to leave you with these two slides. Uh, the first one is 10 questions to be prepared to answer as you start to work with a virtual conference provider or set of vendors. It's really a good idea to ask some consistent questions of the vendors and they will ask some questions of you. And these are the ones that they're gonna need you to know about in order to give you pricing and to really get a sense of how they would produce your conference. I, I won't read through these, but if you have any particular questions about any of these, please ask me in the Q&A and I'll be glad to go through them. And lastly, questions that you should ask. Not all virtual conference vendors are the same by, by any means. You need to ask about pricing, support, engagement, um, 
Uh, do they have references? How long have they been doing uh, this kind of work? And I would also suggest the last question, what percentage of your team is US-based? Let, let's keep as some US people uh, employed during this time, both on the production side and on support. So I hope uh, some of that is useful. And, and Tara, I'll turn it back over to you for any questions. Wonderful, thank you, Lance. Yes, we do have some questions. Um, one um, is that, uh, are there any, and this might need to be for the broader group at the end, um, so feel free to punt if you need to, but um, questions, thoughts around more social events, galas, fundraising. So, you know, associations or nonprofits looking to, you know, uh, raise funds to support their, their endeavors. Um, so virtual meetings and conferences seem doable, um, but uh, questions on how to produce and manage these larger social events virtually. Um, any thoughts or suggestions around that? Well, I haven't done anything in the in the realm of uh, galas, uh, but I have been working with people who want to do board meetings. Those are more formal meetings, uh, so, so but but they are uh, large amounts of people who all need to be seen, and some formal processes that need to happen during uh, those. And those those can be produced. Uh, they absolutely can be produced with the tools that we have now. It's just a matter of planning ahead of time. And obviously they're gonna be live, they're not gonna be pre-recorded. And, and making sure that everybody is coming into it, knowing what their responsibilities are and testing their webcams and making sure that their microphones work so that you don't have uh, technical glitches that can really get in the way of those kinds of events being successful. But if any of the other panelists uh, ha have thoughts on that, please. Does anyone else have any thoughts to share around more social um, kind of a what's the word I'm looking for? Not entrepreneurial, but um, kind of a, a need based or uh, my brain is my, my, my copy. My tea should have been copy. Um, but anyways, social events. Uh, anyone else have any thoughts or suggestions? We recently did a virtual open mic, which was six hours long as a fundraiser. It was a marathon, six hours, but it was nice because we kept having new people coming in, um, doing spoken word, doing poetry, doing some fantastic performers. Um, and we have people from all over the world tuning in. And then every few, every say three performers, there'd be another pitch from the organization that we were fundraising for to print, um, uh, print PPE for health workers in Colombia. So it, it worked really well as kind of a, an ongoing event. Definitely some more things uh, that we could have added to that, but I think there's a lot of potential for these kind of uh, more fun fun events, one of a better word. That's excellent, James. I, I also think that uh, I agree with, uh, with, with, with what Lance was saying, but it's uh, this necessity is the mother of invention. And I think this innovation I'm speaking about is going to be going lots of ways, ways we haven't even begun to think about how we can bring people together um, we're starting to do that. We're starting to uh, do you know, with Zoom meetings or with these virtual meetings and the ex explosion of uh, innovation that's happening in this space. It's going to really look different in, in a year's time frame than it does right now, I think, with lots of new ideas, lots of new best practices and best ways of communicating. And it, and it can be used, I think, for many, many types of events. And uh, But then for the really large scale ones, as Lance was mentioning, it's a you know, there are tools that exist right now that can get information out to lots and lots of people. Um, thank you, Corbin, very much. I'm, there are so many questions around pivoting to virtual platforms for virtual. So I, I'd actually like to save those to the end because I wanna make sure that James has time to walk yep. through his content. And I'd actually like to join the conversation at that point to share more from uh, my point of view as well. So uh, if that's okay with you, if there's any there's, let me just scroll through and make sure if there's any other specific questions for um, Lance. Um, so um, yeah, some of these are just around platform providers. So I think we can save that more to, to the general questions at the end. So I'll go ahead and um, pass it over to James. Thank you so much, Lance, for sharing all of that. And you know, just kind of as these questions continue to roll in, I think we could spend you know an entire day talking about this, and and just uh, for for this webinar audience to know, um, I know how many questions there are. I know how many people are truly seeking 
information around what does it mean to host a virtual event and james actually is going to get into to a little bit more of that uh, and how do i do it um and just one thing to, to throw out there is that we um we are going to be producing in in june a uh, virtual event from end to end specifically focused on providing planners with that resource set. It's not going to be me talking about it. I'm bringing in subject matter experts to truly help you understand and experience what it feels like to produce an end-to-end -end, um, virtual event, because I know that there's just a lot of questions around that right now. So James, uh, and this is a great segue, so handing it over to James, who's done this, um, and um, look forward to your content. Great, thank you, Tara. Just checking, you can see my screen okay? All great, thank you. Okay, well, thank you to uh, Pathball for hosting this and to all the previous uh, speakers for their fantastic insight. Uh, my name is James Ellsmore. I run Island Innovation. We're a small uh, communications agency uh, focused on the sustainable development and the climate change uh, sector. Uh, but I think uh, the lessons and the case study I'll, I'll share a little bit with you about uh, should be applicable regardless of your sector. And I really want to talk about why I think virtual events are so powerful. Um, this is not a new thing, as uh, Lance was saying. We're really uh, this is just we're seeing right now the acceleration of a trend that was already happening. And in a way, for people like me who organise virtual events, uh, there's been a lot of positives uh, from this in that. The innovation is moving so quickly now and uh, this time last year when I was looking for tools there were way fewer options than there are now and the tools are just getting better and better so I think it's an exciting time in that sense of virtual events because we're being forced and pushed to to innovate and people are seeing the potential of um, of this technology I mean Pathable alone in a short period of time has responded to this demand um, has made a jump forward to tailor that solution for virtual events um, incorporating the uh, Zoom integration, which I think is a really exciting development that people can access sessions directly from their um, app, which wasn't really available before. So just to tell you a little bit about our own event, um, the Virtual Island Summit was first hosted in September last year. We had over 4,000 participants, 100 speakers, 27 sessions, uh, representing together 250 islands from all over the world. Now, you might be thinking, why an island summit? Well, for us, this technology was really attractive because it allowed us to do something which would have been almost prohibitively expensive in person. How do we have a conversation with the Caribbean, the Pacific, Hawaii, um, European islands? Or how do you get people in the same room? Because a lot of these areas are actually facing similar challenges, and there are big opportunities to share information. So it meant that we could organize a panel with speakers from Hawaii, Jamaica, Mauritius, and Malta, all in the same room. And you imagine the budget we would have need to have to bring all those people together in person. It also meant that we weren't biased towards one location. If we'd have had this event in, let's say, the Caribbean, uh, we would have been very biased in the content towards that, and it allowed us to be, to be more open. And so you all can see that obviously now there's a reason why we're really pushing towards virtual events. Uh, but before this, there were plenty of, of reasons to do that. Um, and for us, this was an opportunity to share good practices and in, in information in a way that hadn't really been done before, because we were also able to bring together people from the grassroots level, innovators doing very localized projects, right up to government ministers and prime ministers who spoke at the event and everyone in between bringing together the private sector, the public sector, universities, NGOs, all of which are important players when we're talking about sustainable development. And so for us, that was the power of a virtual summit. Before we envisioned um, what's happening right now, we could bring all these different people together and, and do something and have conversations that would have been really challenging in person. Um, I also want to mention that our own team, I mean, we operate as a virtual company, so we have teams spread over six, six oh, I'm not sure why that just happened. There you go. Um, we had our own teams spread over six countries on four different continents. So we were quite prepared or in a way for what was happening, what's happening now. Um, it hasn't really changed our operations in a way, and it's given us some agility in being able to do this and bring everyone together um, to keep working despite what's happening. For me, virtual events are an opportunity for radical inclusivity. 
I'm not sure what's happening with my slideshow, so apologies for that. These are the fun challenges we have of doing virtual events, but hopefully- If you get stuck, let me know. I can also pull them up on my end. Yeah, I'll just have to put it not in, not in presentation mode, because um, I don't know what's happening and the pictures disappeared, which is a shame, because that was the story I was about to, about to tell you. <laughs> but essentially, um, the idea here is radical inclusivity. You can have, people from anywhere in the world joining, presenting your event and use that as a really an opportunity to increase and, and offer something better that would be difficult for an in-person event. Um, the map that I had here was to show you an island where we had a presenter come from. I don't know if you can see it down here, probably not, but Tristan da Cunha, a tiny little island, halfway between Cape Town and Buenos Aires in the middle of the South Atlantic. Population of 250 people, takes a week to get there on a boat that goes four times a year from Cape Town. So if you want to talk about isolation, this is pretty much it. Would we have been able to get a speaker during our event in London or New York uh, from this island to come and talk to us? Unlikely. But by doing a virtual conference, we were able to have this person join in, do a, they don't have internet, so they were able, or good internet, so they were able to call in and present. And really that, that was opening this up to bring in presenters that we wouldn't have been able to bring in otherwise. But that also applies beyond geography. Think about people, it might be the stay-at-home parent that has no way of being able to travel to come to your event, but has something, some really powerful research to offer. Um, it could be someone with a disability who for whatever reason can't travel as well. So these are all things that pre prevent people, whether they're participants or speakers, from being involved. Um, and now you, you're able to bring people in from, from their home. So I think the opportunity here uh, for involving such a wide variety of, of people is, um, is huge. I'm going to try again and present. No, it doesn't seem to be working, so you'll have to just see the... Um... Now that's disappeared. Tara, would I'm you mind... I'm, I'm happy to pull it up on my end, yeah, just so that we can get the full experience. This is very strange. <laughs> it is strange, yeah. No problem, though. Let's stop showing my, stop showing my on screen. Well, sorry about that, everyone. I need this one of the. Uh, there are real people behind these screens, everybody. That's that just uh, <laughs> goes to show. Um, okay, there we go. So that was the. The yeah, island that, that James was referencing. It is, and bringing someone from uh, from that pop, from that island to present was the was the point of that slide. Can you go to the okay. next slide? Absolutely. So we've already heard why why host a virtual event, um, and these are all reasons again beyond the current crisis. This is why I think it's really exciting and important that investing any time that you invest in developing virtual products now is a valid investment for the long, long term. It's not just about the six months ahead. This is a long-term trend, acceleration um, right now, and but, but, but in the long-term, people are going to still be using these virtual events because there's so much to offer. As I said, world-class experts that you can potentially bring in that you wouldn't have been able to get to come in if it was required for them to fly across, across the world. There's a really good variety of formats that you can use. Um, that diverse range of, of viewpoints and speakers and participants um, one of the most important reasons before this in our sector was about the carbon emissions. How do you hold a low carbon or zero carbon event? Um, that is kind of paled into insignificance right now, but that's going to be a long-term trend as well. Particularly if we're doing events about climate change, it's difficult to do that and then fly in speakers from all over the world. So it's, it was important for us in that sense. And for a lot of our clients when we're organizing events, they want that to be zero carbon. And I actually think in the Engage Your audi Audience um, uh, opportunities. These events in a way can be more engaging than an in-person event. Um, you can have people commenting, asking questions, having side discussions while someone is presenting, create these polls, create so much data as an organizer. The data that you can create is far more specific and far more valuable than you'd ever be able to do in an in-person event. So there are all these extra things that you're able to, to achieve. And I think the networking opportunities also, people often say, oh, well, for a virtual event, where are the networking opportunities? But instead of kind of bumping into people while you're having coffee and just having random conversations until you have someone, until you find the person that's relevant uh, for what you're looking for, you can really target as an attendee where um, looking for networks and looking for those connections that will be helpful for you. So I think there's a targeted element there. 
that's uh, that's really helpful. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Tara. Absolutely. So th th these are kind of some other opportunities maybe for you as an organizer or for clients that you're working with. And there was a couple of questions before about sponsors. I think that's something that people are really worried about. So these are actually really useful um, towards sponsors. To be honest, I think it's we're going into unknown territory a little bit. A lot of sponsors, they're not really sure how much they should be paying. They're worried. How many times have you heard someone tell you that they have 50,000 people, 100,000 people on the mailing list? But what does that really mean? It's so difficult for you to know. We have a smaller mailing list than that, but ours is very targeted and we keep it very up to date. And so actually it might be more valuable than the person that has 10 times more people on their mailing list. But if you're trying to work out as a marketing team how to how to value this, it's that that is a huge challenge. I think a lot of potential sponsors don't quite know about that yet. I also think there's a tendency, sponsors want to see a lot more people in your event than they would do if it was an in-person event for the same amount of money. So the expectation is more people. For us, that led us to the decision to not charge for any of the events. It was interesting what Lance was saying about these kind of high ticket events that are virtual as well. Um, but on the, other, on the flip side, for the participants, they are really not sure about paying for events either. There's so much free content right now. It can be, unless you have a really niche audience or a really committed audience, it's a real challenge to get people to pay for the event. So I think our, our model was to not have any uh, fees for participants, but all of our income then came from sponsorships. And I think even if we'd have asked $10, let's say, for people to join in, the loss of, the, the, we would have had obviously fewer people register, and there's a trade-off there with how many people you have registered to tell your sponsors, but then also any income that you get from charging people. Um, and one possible solution, just kind of going on a tangent here, but one possible solution there is some kind of VIP package. So that's what we're considering for this year, having a free entry level, but then having VIP packages that we can then charge um, extra for. But there's so much unknown territory here, um, which is exciting, uh, but, but also makes it very difficult for these marketing teams looking for sponsorship. So, I mean, I think most of these things here, I won't go through all of them, but business development, brand building, there's obviously huge opportunities there for uh, potential clients or organizers to use events. Um, and I'm hoping that that will get seen uh, more. We'll go into the next slide, please. So just quickly, and then I'll wrap, wrap up. I think a lot of attention has been paid to which technologies. These are the three questions that I always get asked the most about with virtual events. The first is which software do we use? Um, how do you recreate that networking experience? How do you engage your audience? They're all really important connection. Uh, they're all really important things to consider. And I'm happy to uh, go into go into more if you want to contact me on, on the specifics of those. But if you can go to the next slide, please, Tara. Um, my key takeaway would be that it's not just about what technology you do. It's about how you communicate with your audience. Um, I have seen so many very well done events that fail at the last hurdle because people are confused about how to log in. The link isn't clear. They get redirected through three different sites and you lose people. It only takes one extra click to lose a large percentage of people. And I think often that's um, not enough attention is paid for that. So I'd say, yes, obviously it's important to choose a really good platform, but actually it's even more important to have clear signposting for both your speakers and your attendees so they know exactly um, where they should be going. Uh, Final slide, please, Tara. So the future is a really, <laughs> this is a really open-ended question. I mean, whether it's virtual events or the, the economy, we really don't know. Um, but I think there's some really exciting opportunities. As I said, I think this is all going to be um, a long-term trend regardless of the coronavirus pandemic. These virtual events are going to be really useful. Um, would invite you, if you're interested in any questions I've raised, we have a free online training. Um, on our website, so feel free to send me an email and I can share, share with you that online training that goes into a little bit um, more detail. But these, ev these events are not going to replace physical events in the long term. Um, we're just going to, we're, both events, both types of events are going to be really important. I see physical events are going to come back, but see them as two different things that serve different purposes, uh, both of which can be really valuable. So I'll leave it there so we have time for questions. Thank you.
Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, James. So one thing I want to call out, um, just given that I have all, all, all the controls here, is um, as due diligent presenters, we were meeting prior to the webinar actually officially starting. So we had been on this call for about 20 minutes before um, we went live to all of you. So I'm showing a countdown timer that's making me a little bit nervous. So in the crazy circumstance that GoToWebinar decides to end our webinar in the next minute, we will find a way to continue to facilitate all of these great questions because there are so many. Um, James, just to tee it off for you, um, how do you manage the difference in time zones? So if you're holding a virtual event for attendees across the globe, how do you put together a, 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 an agenda, like having sessions that in, empower attendees to not have to set up in the middle of the night? Yeah, well, the one thing that we can't control, unfortunately, is time. So the, there is a limitation there. In terms of, obviously, there has to be some level of time. Our audience was very biased towards the Americas and Europe. So we did hold more sessions that suited those times. But we did also have some sessions in the middle of the night for Australia, Asia, Pacific, um, particularly the Pacific, because it was an island themes conference. So I think um, the first thing is just looking at where your audience is and then making a decision based on that. But it's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation. Obviously, if you have sessions at a certain time, you'll attract more people that that suits for. Um, the second is making it really easy, finding a way to make sure attendees can find the, the agenda in their own time zone. So whether that's just a WordPress app that they can update it, I'm sure Pathable has a way that within the app that you can update the agenda. And then the third is recording of sessions. So making sure that uh, things are recorded and easily, easily accessible. And I think it was, was it either Corbin or Lance had mentioned, um, that there's, there are ways to keep people engaged, even if they're watching the video, there's still, you can have chat box, comments, something like that. So people, even if it's in the middle of the night for them, they watch it the next day, they can still engage somehow. I think all those things are important. Perfect. Um, and how far in advance do you recommend, and this is a great question for all of the planners, because this is such a different sometimes way, although I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit more about like how not different it is in many ways around logistics timelines planning, but how far in advance do you recommend pre-planning for a virtual event? The, the, the longer the better is the, is the is the basic answer. The more time you have to promote, the better. I would say for a, let's say a one-off webinar like this, the bare minimum you need is two weeks, um, ideally a month if you can. But obviously you have to work within your own constraints. For a larger summit, three months, not six. Again, the longer you have, the better. It just depends on your own audience and the format and how many sessions there are. But ultimately, it's about how many people who are potential potential leads you can get your registration link in front of them. If you have a longer time to be doing that, then you're going to have more people signing up at the end of the day. Yeah, agreed. Um, just scrolling through because we have so many um, questions. Um, so for a live event going virtual that is normally five days with multiple tracks and many sessions, do you see the benefit of having the event in the same footprint? What are your thoughts about spreading the sessions over weeks to give people a chance to take advantage of the content? There's no right answer to any of these questions. And a lot of this is about marketing and how you communicate it. The advantage of calling something a summit and having it for one week is that you can brand it as a summit and as an event, as opposed to a webinar series. And it does create a certain attraction. If you're, we, we could have done the same session spread throughout the year we probably would have got interest, but I don't think we'd have been able to get media coverage. I don't think we would have been able to reach as many people. So for us, it was a way of, of branding, even if we are really, they were just webinars. Um, we also have, so we had 27 sessions spread out over one week. Um, don't expect everyone is going to turn up to every session. We had some people who were really interested in, in electric vehicles and they just showed up for that session. Other people who attended, um, well, I don't think apart from me that anyone attended all 27 because they were all different times of the day. But um, you know, a lot of people attended as many as possible. So you just have to kind of accept that. Yeah, we had 4,000 people register, but it, but the average session maybe had 400 people in. Perfect, thank you. Um, someone had a question that happened earlier on that was related to that open mic uh, event that you were sharing about. How exactly did you fundraise for that? So we did, um, the idea was it was six hours long. So again, people aren't staying for the whole six hours. 
it was we had people in uh, South America and in Europe. So the idea was that we'd have performers in Europe earlier, and then as it got into the evening, we could switch over, um, and people could just drop in and out as they as they wanted to. But essentially, you'd have different people show up for their performances, and then a representative of the nonprofit we were fundraising for every now and then would do a quick presentation, and we were asking our viewers to donate um, using that. So the idea was you're providing something for free, entertaining, and then there's a there's a message among that, and for those that wanted to, they could they could donate. Okay, thank you. Um, any other? There's a there's so many questions that came in earlier that I want to make sure that we revisit. And the good news is, is we're all still here. <laughs> um, and I want to call out that we have about nine minutes left um, to field these. So if there are any other specific questions for James. Um, please go ahead and type those into the questions box. Otherwise, I will start revisiting all of these broader questions that have come in over the duration. So thank you, James, so much for sharing your experience. Really um, inspirational what you were able to create. Okay, so I'm going to back it up. And of course, I'll keep an eye out if anything um, specific to you, James, comes back. So let's open up the conversation back to all of us, I think. Um, this is a point at which I'd love to to jump in and help um, share my perspective as well. So um, this came in pretty early on, um, uh, specifically around exhibitors and sponsors. And I know that I, I get this question a lot. So educational content seems like an easy transition from virtual to, I'm sorry, from in-person to virtual, but what about exhibits? How do you, how do you keep sponsor revenue up when you're going virtual. So I'll, I, I'd love to share thoughts, but if anybody else has um, some thoughts they, they wanna share on that, um, please do. Uh, I'll just say, I think it has a lot to do with the offer of what the offer from each sponsor is gonna be. Uh, it's not like, you know, there's a reason that they put lunch down in the conference hall in the exhibit hall because you just you won't go there otherwise in 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 many cases so uh, a virtual sponsor area or exhibit hall i think has to have really strong messaging you got to hit them with that before during and after the event and the offers have to be really good really strong also seeing some conferences where they're giving a, uh, a set of concurrent sessions to the main sponsors and the sponsors are doing uh, five, 10 minute uh, uh, briefs, you know, presentations uh, about their products. So th those are a couple thoughts. Yeah, Thank if I you. jump in there as well, I think the main difference is that people can and will leave much easier than they can do in a physical event. So it's, if you have someone, pitch at you for 30 minutes, you're probably not going to stay in that session. And that's something I, even when we have sponsors come on, I remind them to share lessons as opposed to just pitching uh, to people. It's really difficult in a lot of things, for example, if you have your sponsor pay for your CEO lunch where you have all the CEOs come together. Well, you could do a CEO Zoom meeting, but can you guarantee that those people are going to show up? Whereas if they're in the hotel anyway, going for lunch. So one thing that we've been looking at is matchmaking. I think there's a lot of potential if, if your sponsor's looking specifically for matches, then then that could be a potential. But obviously it varied. We had the Canadian Ministry of Natural Resources as a sponsor. They have a very different agenda than a large um, a large corporate that is looking for specific leads. So you have to adapt it. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. I, I agree with all of that. And I think a, another important component too is thinking about, you know, what are the end takeaways that your exhibitors and, and sponsors are looking for? They're looking for brand recognition. They're looking and they're looking for lead generation. And so how can you need to make sure that you're choosing a platform that supports that. So whether you're a conference that might normally have a hosted buyer program, making sure that the platform supports that kind of functionality, um, making sure that it's easy for an attendee to, you know, kind of come on to, you know, a virtual exhibitor booth here is going to look different than if you were walking down a trade show floor, and that's fine. Um, and but you want to be able to make sure that they can just click a button and either connect with someone in chat or even better connect with someone, you know, immediately one-to-one -one video is as, as if you were walking into a booth to, to facilitate a conversation. And how are people, uh, how are exhibitors and sponsors taking those leads away? How are they able to showcase their products? You know, that 
making sure that whatever solution that you go with, uh, as far as a virtual event platform, has that functionality so that you can, you know, to, that, to James's point of communication, so that you can put together a package that says, sure, we might not be coming together in person, but you're still going to get these same uh, elements of what you'd look for from uh, experience by exhibiting in person. Okay, um, gosh, so many wonderful questions. Um, so, gosh. <laughs> um, thoughts on events uh, at universities, things that might be less corporate. So we've talked a lot about what I would consider more corporate meetings and events. So um, something that might be more familial, a uh, family weekend, a homecoming, um, you know, so this is someone from university who's saying, help, what what can I do given that, you know, we, we still are likely going to have all the social distancing? Are there any thoughts or best practices around how they could still create opportunities virtually? So hard. Yeah, it is. One thing that I've, I started to hear a little bit about is, you know, thinking about when we talked about galas earlier and how can we recreate this in this uh, physically distant environment, uh, the idea of the uh, silent auctions or, or virtual auctions that have been fundraising tools that's possibly could be migrated over into this kind of environment. So you're getting a little bit uh, from there. But in terms of like, let's have the pep rally, that's... Uh, that's going to be a challenge right there. I'll, I'll defer to my panelists on that one. Yeah, I think this is, it's it's one of those things where we're all just still, it's still so new, despite, you know, many of us having been, you know, we're, I'm here in California, this is month two of sheltering in place for us. So, you know, we've done two months already and, and is still continuing to do so. And, um, you know, I think there are, there are great things that have developed around what I would get yeah, corporate meetings and events. And we're still all trying to understand how to create community in, in a variety of different ways. Um, and, you know, I think that there are probably virtual solutions that would exist. Maybe they weren't built for something like mm -hmm. a homecoming or for something like a family weekend, but, um, you know, I just, platforms that that currently exist can probably be adapted to to meet your needs depending on uh what exactly you're hoping what is your goal i think one thing that's important for for all planners regardless of how you, the, the type of event that you're you're planning is keeping in mind what are the goals for your venture program you know at the end of the day if they're, they're your internal goals if they're your client goals what are they and so therefore making sure that whatever you are developing whatever you know logistics plan you're following has, still has that end goal uh, in mind. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead. Uh, I, I was just going to say, you know, I think some of this we just need to follow the kids and see what they're doing. I'm amazed. I have a, a senior who's just graduating from University of Maryland, another one there, and the ways in which they connect are mm -hmm. in place. But some of this has to percolate for another few months, maybe has to go into next year. But we're going to find that we're creating new large scale solutions for bringing people together by just I, I think in, I think the kids and their demand for this are going to help lead the way. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Mm -hmm. I think um, really simple, go ahead. simple, just quickly um, for, for creating that community. Um, in Zoom, you can use breakout rooms. So you have a large session with 50 people in, and you can usually just let them go out into small groups of four or five and have a discussion. Because clearly, if you have a group of 50 people, those little side discussions are what's missing there. So thinking about a tool that can use break, and other platforms, Remo has them too. But I think breakout rooms for small discussions are a really nice tool for that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they need to be facilitated, but they can be yes. they can be really powerful. And the reporting back into the group can also be very powerful and a great collaboration tool for the event. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, there are so many questions and we're at time and I really want to be mindful of everybody's day and involvement. So here's what I would like to promise. I mean, some of these are specific to virtual event platforms, which I would love to field. Um, some of them are specific to the presenters. I will send those out. Um, 
I will make myself available if anybody wants to hop on a Zoom call. I am perfectly happy to continue the conversation. Um, and I just want to thank all of my panelists. This has been such a, a wonderful discussion. And like I said, we, we, we really could sit here all day because there are just not only questions around the broader, you know, how, if and how do I treat this any different than I might plan a, a logistical in-person event and to literally what, you know, features do I need to be thinking about? So I want to, I, I want to answer these questions. Um, and if, uh, thank you all so much for your time today. Some of the questions have been, are we going to share the content afterwards? Absolutely. Yes. Um, this has been recorded. Um, I will get with the panelists and, and talk about, uh, we, we hadn't decided on sharing out the deck. So I want to make sure that before I promise that, that I've talked with the panelists about what they're mm -hmm. comfortable, uh, sharing out afterwards, but the recording is being, um, uh, recorded and will be shared with all of you after the fact. Um, so thank you all so very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you again to my panelists. Uh, it's been a true pleasure having you. And a round of applause thank to Kara. You. Yeah, thanks, Tara. Great job. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So appreciate it. All right. Well, stay safe, everybody. Thank you. And more to come. We'll continue the conversation. All right. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Take care, everybody.